This episode of The Art Assignment is brought to you by Squarespace. Mark and I arrived to a gray, rainy Washington, D.C. and crawled our way through terrible morning traffic. It could have been bad, but our cabbie had on NPR and we could relax and enjoy the fact that we were not the ones driving. We arrived at our hotel starving and quickly scarfed breakfast in the lobby and pulled out our various devices to get ready for the day. See this? See me double screening? This is not what I should have been doing. At this very moment, there was a press preview for the reopening of the Renwick Gallery, where we really should have been. The kind PR folks provided us with this footage, and watching it is kind of like turning a knife for me. The Renwick houses the Smithsonian's collection of contemporary craft and decorative art, and was about to open after a two-year renovation. They take a progressive approach to this kind of collection ghettoization, presenting work by a wide range of artists and makers, showing, quote, how extraordinary handmade objects have shaped the American experience and continue to impact our lives. So these are the installations created specifically for the building opening that we should have seen instead of writing emails and researching ramen places for lunch. This was a pretty major snafu, but we did a little better after that. After taking our sweet time deciding on lunch, we headed out and took the metro, descending into the DuPont Circle Station at the weirdly slow pace determined by the escalators. The DC Metro first opened in 1976 and is a magnificent artwork in itself, designed by architect Harry Weiss. Throughout the trip, I basked in the strange, brutalist glory of this metro system. The coffered concrete vaulted ceilings lend a feeling of spaciousness and highlight the remarkable geometries of this complex transit system. The lighting is low, indirect, and otherworldly. If you see no other public art than this in DC, you're still doing okay. We arrived at Dakaya and waited patiently before devouring our steaming bowls of ramen. I got the shoyu and Mark the vegetable. Moving a little more slowly, we got back on the metro, picked up our gear, and headed down Massachusetts Avenue, aka Embassy Row. We took in the parade of passing buildings, each with its own distinct architecture and design, on our way to American University to meet up with artist Molly Springfield. We stopped into the university's museum in their Cats and Arts Center and saw some really delicate, captivating works on paper by Beverly Ress. Then we met up with Molly and did some filming there before heading to her studio and shooting the rest. When we were done, it was dark, and guess what? We were hungry. So on a tip from a friend, we decided to walk to a place called Compass Rose that specializes in international street food, but served inside instead of on the street. It was super dark, so you'll have to trust me that I had a bourbon drink that was great despite its name, hashtag LOL, and then noshed on dishes that were delicious despite being culturally confusing. We had takoyaki, or Japanese octopus fritters, bell puri chaat, an Indian puffed rice snack, and tostones, or fried plantains. It was Embassy Row all in one dark little place. It was much nicer the next day, and we started out at the Phillips Collection. They were playing host to an exhibition Gauguin to Picasso drawn from private Swiss collections, but that's not why I was there. I was there to think about the singular vision of the eponymous Duncan Phillips, who gathered this astounding collection by not only being the grandson of a steel magnate, but also by nurturing close relationships with artists. Masterpieces of the 20th century appear throughout this warren of buildings, which started in 1921 with the Phillips family home and extended into a music room, a modernist wing in the 60s, and another addition in the aughts. The Phillips collection fuses architecture from different times as well as art from different times, providing room after room of intimate art viewing moments, interspersing works by Paul Clay, and Van Gogh, and Mondrian, and Jacob Lawrence, and Edward Hopper, with contemporary works like Nikki S. Lee's Photography, and Question Bridge, Black Males, a video installation that looks to represent and redefine black male identity in America. Then there's a Rothko room, and this is exactly how Rothko wanted his work to be seen. You're alone in a room with four of his paintings in close proximity with the lighting just so. And one floor up, you encounter a recent work by Wolfgang Leib that you smell before you see. It's a small chamber lined with beeswax and lit by a single bulb, providing another immersive experience. Duncan Phillips called this place an intimate museum combined with experiment station, and that's just how it feels. Not like a history that is organized and settled, but one that is still being worked out, re-examined, and remixed. Then we returned to my beloved metro and headed to the National Mall. The mall is under construction and not looking its best, but who cares? It's a symbol of progress and we're there for the art anyway. We stopped in the Freer and Sackler galleries, which present the Smithsonian's Asian art holdings to see the Freer's Peacock Room. This is what it looks like well lit in the photos Wikipedia provides, but this is more what it's like to experience it. But anyway, it's the former dining room of rich guy Frederick Leyland that features a painting by James McNeil Whistler, as well as elaborate wall decorations done by Whistler without Leyland's permission or payment. This resulted in one of the most epic art battles of all time, which you should really go read about. But what's interesting is that we were lucky to visit while Darren Waterston's contemporary 
extraordinary reimagination of the room was on view in the adjacent Sackler Gallery. Waterston reconstructs the room as a decadent ruin, making visible the room's nasty history and commenting on the excesses of both that Gilded Age and our own. Then we made a quick detour through the National Gallery of Art Sculpture Garden to say hello to these works by Saul LeWitt, Tony Smith, Roxy Payne, Roy Lichtenstein, and Klaus Oldenburg and Kosha van Bruggen. I disregarded the secret of enjoying art, and that's making sure your blood sugar isn't too low. So we just kind of quickly saluted these totems and hurried to Burrito, a totem of trendy eating. They make burrito-sized sushi rolls. Wait, do I need to say that again? Burrito-sized sushi rolls. Sure, it's just a differently shaped hand roll, which has existed for some time, but these weren't just novel and well-marketed, they were good. And just the fuel we needed to continue on our art marathon to the National Museum of Women in the Arts. There we saw an excellent exhibition of photographs by Esther Bubbly, who was hired by the Office of War Information and documented life in the United States throughout the 40s, 50s, and 60s. The museum also had on a great show called Pathmakers. It featured a really interesting mix of work from the office in separate spheres of art and craft and design. And I especially enjoyed this installation by Polly Applebaum, a display of the work of designer Ella Jongarius, and of course the work of art assignment alumna Michelle Grabner. Next up, quick stops at Hemphill Gallery to see a show of work by Renee Stout, and Adamson Gallery, which had a show of magnificent photographs by Gordon Parks. I had just written about Parks for our animation in the Alex Soth episode about the FSA's photography project, so it was a treat to see the works in person and in large scale. Then we made our way to Transformer, a nonprofit art organization to have coffee with Victoria Reese, its executive and artistic director. Transformer does important work on behalf of emerging artists locally in DC as well as nationally and internationally. They do this not only through exhibitions but also through educational programs, partnerships with other institutions, and an annual silent auction and benefit party that they had closed their gallery space to get ready for. They had a lovely installation in their storefront by Paris-based artist Hélène Garcia called Let's Drink a Dozen Roses, providing us further proof that bigger isn't always better and art and new new ideas can thrive in unexpected places. We ended the day back on the National Mall. I forgot to mention it was Veterans Day, which I'm ashamed to admit usually comes and goes for me with little activity in honor of the important day. We walked along the Vietnam Veterans Memorial as the last of the chairs were being broken down from the earlier ceremonies, and scanned with many others the names of the over 58,000 servicemen and women who died during the war. The wall, as it's called, is a stunning work of art, the best in the city in my view, designed by artist and architect Maya Lin when she was only a senior in college. It was a moving experience and one that stayed with me even as we continued on to the much less moving Lincoln Memorial to fight for photo space, and definitely stayed with me as we witnessed a beautiful sunset over the reflecting pool. The next day we got up early to try out GBD Donuts, but were devastated to find that they don't open till 11 on most weekdays. Not that early, GBD. And we didn't have much time, so we were kind of forced to go upstairs to drink for a juice instead. It was actually really good juice, which I do recommend, but when you're expecting donuts, well, it's not donuts. Then off we went to DC's foremost contemporary art institution, the Hirshhorn, which come to think of it is kind of shaped like a donut. It was designed by architect Gordon Bunshaft as a quote, large piece of functional sculpture and opened to the public in 1974. Its curved galleries define and expand your experience of the work it contains, and its windows provide views out to the National Mall, with an exhibition of works drawn from their permanent collection. Ditching the tired tactic of organizing by chronology or geography, the curators have opted instead to create thematic groupings. You get to see the treasures of their collection, like early sculptures by Klaus Oldenburg and Robert Gober's Window to Another Time and Place, along with newer additions by Tsai Gua Chang, Yinka Shonabare, and Nick Cave. There's a wonderful piece by Rachel Harrison on view, which may at first glance look like another modernist-informed sculpture until you register its roughly hewn structure and bright pink plaster that undercut any read of it as traditional. Oh, and the toy wrestler climbing it, which for me is a brilliantly cheeky nod at the idea of heroic artistic ambition. The galleries combine works from different times and sensibilities and parts of the world that talk to each other and have uniting principles. Like this gallery, that brings together paintings from the 1960s by Warhol and Ed Rouché, with sculptures from the 80s by Saul LeWitt and Katerina Fritsch, and a more recent painting by Ellsworth Kelly. You're encouraged to think about the foundations of pop art and how the strategy of repetition connects it to minimalism and beyond, as well as how artists investigate color and form. We also made sure to see the Barbara Kruger installation that fills the museum's lower level lobby and surrounds you with open-ended questions, and the enormous 1974 Dan Flavin installation that immerses you in color and begs to be viewed from many angles. Before we left, we peeked in at a truly enjoyable video work by Spanish artist Sergio Caballero in their black box gallery. You can watch the whole thing on Vimeo. Then we headed over the Potomac to the headquarters of PBS to say hi to Lauren Sachs and Kelsey Savage, 
We got a good look around the place and ran into a few startling posters before heading out for a light lunch of South Korean fried chicken wings at Bonshan. Remember, we were only running on juice here, so it was no time for restraint. I felt a little guilty ending our trip with a chain, but at least it was an international chain. And you know, every meal can't be sushi burritos. So Mark and I really thought our parting shot of this video should be sunset at the reflecting pool, and it really should be. But I'm not clever enough to rework the chronology of this video, so we're just gonna bring it back now to erase the visual of chicken wings and draw some conclusions about our time in this city. DC is a remarkable whole body experience a place not just for singular views or paintings on a wall, but whose landmarks demand that you move through them, immerse yourself in them, and see them from many angles. It's an international city and a smart city, one where far-flung ideas and flavors and values are allowed to intermix and be tested. It's a city that honors the past and thinks critically about the future, and almost all of it you can experience for free. This episode of The Art Assignment is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace is an easy way to create a website, blog, or online store for you and your ideas. Squarespace features a user-friendly interface, custom templates, and 24-7 customer support. Try Squarespace at squarespace.com forward slash art assignment for a special offer. Squarespace. Build it beautiful.